Should you tune your systems flat? Is it our goal to both design and then process and align systems so that we can get the response to look like an ice skating rink? Is flat really an equal representation of all frequencies and what we like hearing? Uh, is that what should we strive to, to go for? Uh, I'm going to go off the right of the bat and say no, but well, how much should we deviate from flat? I thought we want things to be represented well, and if we start to mess with the response, is that going to mess with my mix? Well, what about the room? What about a corporate show versus a rock show? We're going to get into all that today. But first, oh, I'd like to, to give you access to my audio math survival spreadsheet. If you're tracking with me here, it means you probably want to get better results out of your sound system. And you cannot do that unless you understand the fundamentals of how sound works and how it's working together for you. And this spreadsheet takes all the scary math and puts it in, I think, a little bit more digestible format. I want you to do the work and learn it, but you're able to get real results by over, I think, 30 calculators in this thing now. You're able to understand decibels better. You'll be able to understand how comb filters work. Do you need delay speakers? How to space your front fills? Anyway, I think I think it's a great tool. You can get it at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit or at the link below. All right, let's jump in today to see if you should tune your systems flat or not. Let's start off by defining our terms. What in the world do I mean by flat? So a system tuning software like this, smart or open sound meter, SysTune, whatever you want to use, you can take a measurement. This is a two channel measurement. This is not an RTA. It is a transfer function. And we can see here down below, this is the magnitude response of this particular speaker. I was tuning a room and this was the rig before I touched anything. It was, it was a pretty simple thing. It's just one speaker covering the room. I need to make sure it was pointing the right direction, had the right tonality. So after capturing this, I can see from the data that it's mostly flat, AKA even in tonality and level from about 250 on up to 8K. And then we see a drop off at 8K and then we see a low mid rise to here. Uh, this, this system didn't have any subs, so that's why we're not seeing anything down here in the basement. And so to tune a system flat means in tuning is a lot of things. It's verifying all speakers. It's making sure you have the, the right coverage, but you're using tools like EQ, delay, and, and other processing to make the system sound great. So when, when people say tune the system flat, what they're meaning by that is EQ it so that all frequencies are equally represented when I measure them with a measurement microphone. So I would have taken an EQ and done an inverse move here. I would go to the high end and increase it so it would be flat and look like this. And I'd use an EQ maybe right here down the middle and flatten some of that out, do a flip of what's going on, make it flat. This is common in studio tuning software, something like Sonoworks Reference ID, uh, I think that's what it's called. And it will measure your studio room and provide an inverse curve or even do that for headphones and get it flat. And that's cool for studio world. And I even use that software and get good results with it. But live, it doesn't quite translate. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit why I do not tune systems flat. I do not think that's the that sound system tuning in a nutshell. It's like, hey, get some EQ, make everything flat. So what then should you shoot for? And that is where target traces come into play. I have another video on the channel that talks about this a little bit more. My methodology methodology has actually changed some since then. So I'm going to show you what I mean. So we go here to my target traces folder. And this is the main one that I use for music and even some corporate shows too. And we'll talk about why that might be different as well. I got this one from Michael Lawrence. He's a phenomenal systems engineer, writes for Pro Sound Web. Uh, works for Rational Acoustics, who makes this software that we're looking at right now, Smart. So anyway, he's he's great and has like done a ton of shows and worked in a huge variety of contexts and has found for music this really works well. So what's different here than flat? Pretty obvious. The low end has a nice bump down here and it starts at 300 hertz and has this up tilt. And then starting at 1K, we have about a dB and a half down tilt and then things die after 16K because we usually don't have much of that. Anyway. And again, I cannot emphasize enough, this is not an RTA measurement. We would have a transfer function that we can see what's lining up here and get good data. So what that means here is if I put a, a magical speaker that was perfectly flat into my room and the room didn't color at all and I stood in front of it, I would get a flat response out of it. Every frequency be equally representative, AKA a straight line across this graph. So what I would do to get this response is provide EQ and up tilt here. 
but that's not usually how the real world works. We have the room affecting what's going on. We have uh, the speaker's own response. We're putting a mix through it. So that 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 cocktail of saying like, well, who gets the low end? Does the speaker do it? Does the mix do it? Does the room do it? It all ends up tying together. So we're, we're, we'll see if we can make that a little bit simpler, but I wanna walk through my other target traces I use. So that's my main one. And this one uh, is similar to, I have it abbreviated L Acoustics um, because it's similar to the L Acoustics curve, but not quite right. But they start their up tilt much earlier at 1K, then slope up, and then um, they have their, their subs up above that. Sometimes it's just going straight up to the sub range, similar with that. But I have it 6 plus 6 because 1... K to 100 hertz is 6 dB, and that's another 6 dB up for the subs. And then this one is 9 plus 6 because it's a 9 dB tilt to 100 hertz, and that's another 6 dB on top of that. So it just has different tonality to it. So that's just going to give you a nice full low end at the concert, not rip anyone's heads off. It, it, that's just what people like. If you tune a system completely flat and had a hip hop act, it would just sound anemic. It sounds anything. Um, it's tempting to think at corporate shows, which a bunch of talking heads that I really want to manage my low end super, super well and never have any low mid buildup because that's where feedback happens. And some of that is true. But what about the CEO has this really cool video that just got made that demos a new product and they had this huge voiceover and explosions and stuff. And it sounds like it's coming through a telephone if your system is flat. So you need some additional low end in, in a live environment. Because you, you don't want to have to go back to your video playback channel and EQ in a bunch of low end because your system's not going to be able to handle it. And so um, don't be scared of having that low mid rise. So that, that bleeds into our conversation of like, we need to assess the program material and the room. And so if you're mixing a rock and pop show, I'm coming in with this target curve and I'm going to get, you know, if it's a left right system, I'm going to get one half of the system. Sorry, here it is. Uh, the one half of the system sound it to this target curve, and then I'm going to walk and I'm going to assess. I'm going to play a reference track and listen if I don't have the band there. But even if I did have the band there or a virtual sound check where I could play back tracks, I would get it to this curve, play some reference tracks that I know. So I have a reference playlist that you can find my Spotify account check it out it's also my audio toolkit that i just call reference and these are tracks that i just know like the back of my hand i if the first song i'm always going to play is phoenix by andrew holmes it just has a really deep kick and a really punchy fat snare so it's like a big hit at 45 hertz and then a big hit at uh, 160 hertz so that that goes subs versus mains in the low end so that's why i have that track vultures by john mayer is a very warm mix and so if it just feels too swimmy and soupy uh in the low end too warm because the room maybe has like a super long reverb time that track will expose that really quickly and the next one we'll play is get lucky really crispy hi-hats really tight bass um, and that really gives me a good deal of like above 1k as i'm moving up to 10k in this target curve, if the hats are too crispy and get too distracting in this range, I know it's a little bit too much. It's also a five string bass on that track, so it gets down way down here in the basement, which is great, so I can hear that. And the vocals, actually the mix is pretty busy in the mid range. It has vocals that have a lot of like throat to them. It's not too much, it's a fantastic mix by Mick Gazowski, but there's just a lot happening in the mid range. So it just kind of exposes if that feels a little bit too cluttered. So all that being said, the big macro picture I'm looking at is this 1K tilt point. And so if I can get from 1K and up to kind of feel right, if I, especially if I'm in a hurry, um, I can use a high shelf on the system to kind of tame some of that. And then from the LF, I can use a low shelf. So you see here the difference between these blue and red traces. So this is what a room is going to do to your system and how it's going to play into the equation. So the blue trace is a GLL file of a speaker. It was a Presonus, one of their studio live, I think the A A15. And I took it from the GLL file, exported it, put it here uh, in open sound meter in this case, and was able to look at it in advance before I went and tuned a room that had that same speaker. And I took the GLL file, you can view it at different distances. So I think it was about 30 feet. So I captured it at 30 feet and that's a blue trace. And then I went inside a room, went on axis with the speaker, placed my measurement 
measurement microphone captured a trace and this is what happened. And we can see here with the green arrow it's showing this 1K tilt point and we're gonna lose top end over distance and we're gonna gain low end because of reverberation. So it's, a, it's the same speaker, they just measured it on the blue trace in an anechoic chamber, which generates the GLL file versus measuring it inside a room. So just know that the room is usually going to build up low frequencies. Another reason why this is, and I talk about this more in a video on my channel called uh, how to deal with boomy rooms and also fix muddy mixes. Those are two separate videos that think would be helpful to you on this topic. But low frequencies are really hard to steer. So a single loudspeaker is going to have a nice pizza slice response of being able to go on a 75 degree speaker, a K12. We all are familiar with this. It's 75 degrees by 75 degrees. But low frequencies, they're long wavelengths. They don't care about that waveguide that's steering high frequencies in your direction. So it's just going to balloon out everywhere. So we have a higher proportion of reflections bouncing out on the room of low frequencies to high frequencies. So that's what's going to get here now in the low mid buildup is that. So it's not just the speaker out the box. We're not going to look at its frequency response like, oh, it's got LF tilt. We also get low mid buildup when we array speakers together. So in a line array, we have maybe 10 boxes and the person in front of a box that's pointed at the first row is only getting the high frequency drivers from that bottom box, but they're getting the low end ballooning out from the whole thing. And that creates some up tilt. Again, some of that's desirable. We want to feel the impact, but all of these things are playing into what's going on. So the best thing is, is do your homework on the design. Uh, once you implement it, tune it to a target curve. Make sure the most, as much of your audience can do that, be in that target curve and then play a test track, walk it. And then if you can run a virtual sound check with your actual board mix and verify that it works. But what if you're, you're, oh, sorry, one more thing about acoustics and we'll move on to how you can meter things and get a little bit more visual data. Lastly, is that someone in the front of your audience might want to experience your show differently than the back row. It feels weird to have a ton of top end coming at you in the back row when the stage feels far away because our brains are trained to have psychoacoustic clues. If we're really close to something, someone goes, Psst, that gets your attention, that little burst of high frequency energy, we're trained to pay attention to it. But if we're far away from something, something sounds distant, someone's on the other side of a wall, we lose top end. So our brains are used to thinking less top end, farther away, more top end, closer to me. So you don't want to artificially make it so someone feels like they're in the front row from like a high frequency uh, proximity standpoint, but we do want to make it even and impactful in the back so that they at least can experience the show well and then it's intelligible. Again, you'll get better at this at times, you kind of do it. Uh, so that's more like the... Uh, the subjective part of the craft is making uh, making those decisions of level variance and total balance front to back. So all that being said, the system front to back will not be, be flat. So let's look uh, here in Reaper. And we're actually going to take a look at some, so a couple metering tools that are helpful to you. Uh, so, you know, smart, obviously can take a measurement of your room, you can get to a target curve, but what if you're in a new room or even mixing broadcast and you can't really trust what you're hearing? You're hearing a bunch of low end is like, is that my mix? Is that the room? Uh, let's take a look at two helpful metering tools that you can use. So if you're on a digital desk, I usually run uh, along with a couple of other meters, these two, and I just pipe out my board mix into my computer and monitor it through these meters. I'm just gonna go ahead and play a track here. You're not gonna be able to hear it, but just to use it as meters. So here's what this track looks like through both Span, which is made by Voxengo, and it's just a normal looking RTA, a single channel measurement. And then this is another tool by Isotope called Tonal Balance Control. If you're not a, a former studio rat like me, you may not be familiar with Isotope's work, but it attempts to make a target trace or target curve for music agnostic of the speakers, just like measuring the music itself while it's still in digital form and leaving. So let's take a look at this mix and see what our meters tell us. We see the, like the kick drum hitting here, 75 at this point. We saw a little bump here as well. But for the most part, this meter looks fairly flat and shows us in a little bit higher detail what's going on. We could put it in a mode called master, which I think it has one octave or third octave weighting. So we can see more at a macro level what's going on. The shaded in part is the average and then you show peaks and the more of the less opacity or more opacity, I forget which way it is. Over here on the right, tonal balance control gives us some guardrails and like, okay, for modern music and you can set presets. So if you're making an R&B show, uh, this is what it'll look like. Huh, 
a lot bigger difference here in the top end. Maybe that's because there's a lot of lo-fi in R&B. Interesting. So EDM, boom, yeah, low end needs to be bumping, right? So you could you could basically choose the genre you're in. If you're unsure for that show, just click modern and it's going to be fine. And you can see, hey, if the mix I'm playing and what I'm listening to can fall within these bounds, I don't see any specific frequency range. Because see down here on the x-axis, uh, 100 hertz, that's 600, that's 2K, it all corresponds up here. So if I'm mixing, especially if it's like a full chorus of a song where all the instruments are playing, it's not just like a down verse two where it's kick, snare, and bass, and you're like, what happened to the top end? It's because the other instruments aren't playing. I'll see if this all jives and aligns. So if I could put a mix, I can see here that aligns up on total balance control as being nice, and then also then the system lines up here and it feels good in the room, I know that's a good match. But if I'm having to consistently push the low end in my mix, or like, you know, if you're like, man, I'm just not getting enough low end or meat out of it, uh, and it still is falling with these lines, that might be a system problem. So it's good to measure first and then put music through it and then put your mix through it in that order so you're not chasing your tail as like, is it my mix or is it the system? So get the system right with the design, then the tuning, verify it with your ears with the track, and then go to virtual sound check and then put an actual band in there. So that's how those meters can, can help you. One last thing I wanted to show you is that not all <clears throat> meters are created equal. We see like, well, this looks kind of flat on this one. And this one has a pretty big down tilt. So how we can assess the tilt <clears throat> of a meter is by playing pink noise. So let me give it time to average. I can't just hit V and reset my averages like smart. So I'm playing pink noise, which is equal energy per octave for the human ear. So it would sound flat to me if I played this. And we can see on this meter on span, there's an up tilt. So that's meaning it is prioritizing high frequencies over lows in this meter. And I can go into the settings and I can change that slope. So I think if I put it at three, it flattens it out. So I can look at it to where it makes pink equal uh, at all frequencies. And here in this meter at tonal balance, we can see that now it has a down tilt instead in the, in the default mode. So now it is giving more weight to low frequencies than it is to high, but nonetheless, it is a, a straight line. So if you see two meters conflicting what they tell you, you just have to see what its internal weighting of frequencies period is doing. So, all right, so bottom line here, what can we expect from a system. So we, we should not get it flat. <laughs> That's not our goal. It's not just to use EQ, make our, make our target, make our uh, system look like an ice skating rink, right? We should be using both the design and the tuning to work together to get to a target curve that we can trust and then use our ears to verify and evaluate that for the goals of our client and the show at hand. Granted, Corporate shows, if all it is is a bunch of lobs, I'm not going to have as much tilt in the system as, as if I was mixing for Metallica, for instance. They want the low end to punch and hit hard, and then even more so on an EDM festival. And this isn't just about mains to sub balance. If someone says I want more low end, I'm going to a low shelf across the entire rig and boosting it, not just going to boost my subs because you shouldn't be mixing on Oxfed subs anyway. You can uh, get at me, bro, in another video, <laughs> but uh, that's my own take. So use matrices for that. But anyway, hope this is helpful for you to kind of iron out that myth of like, if I use system tuning software, that means I'm getting it flat. You're not getting it flat. You're just seeing what the system is telling you, then using the tools you have to get it to where you want it to go and what sounds good for you and your client's goals. I'm Michael Curtis. Make sure and grab the audio toolkit at the link below, and I'll catch you next time.